Welcome everyone to the regular meeting of the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee for April 20th, uh, 2023. I'm Emily Kosky and I am the Vice Chair of this committee. At this time, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll so that we can verify a quorum for this meeting. Councilmember Payne. Present. Wansley. Present. Vita. Present. Chugtai. Present. Vice Chair Kosky. Present. Chair Johnson is absent. There are five members present. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. I will also recognize that we have Councilmember Rainville joining us here today as well. Uh, with that, the agenda for today's meeting is before us. I am going to move to add a new item, which will be item number 19, to receive and file an update on the Bryant Avenue Street reconstruction project. We'll take up this item at the end after we've completed the items on our published agenda. All those in favor of adding this item to the agenda, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. The ayes have it, and that item will be added to the final item on today's, or to be the final item on today's agenda. Uh, before we begin our agenda, I'd like to acknowledge we have some special guests here with us today, um, and uh, would, they're, we're all going to come up and they can uh, get a chance to introduce them themselves. But uh, Director Anderson Kelleher, would you like to do a, a quick introduction uh, right now, too? Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Today with us is a group of uh, delegation from both Finland and the Netherlands. And they are here because they came to visit the North American Snow and Ice Conference, which took place in Omaha. And that was led uh, by Scott Grayson, who's going to give you a wave, and he'll also come up and introduce himself. Scott uh, is the CEO, President and CEO of the American Public Works Association. And so when we talk about Public Works Week, and you'll see some of the posters around, Scott's group is responsible for the promotion of uh, public works careers, but also, uh, I will say personally, is a valuable resource because uh, we gather as uh, directors of large cities and counties at least once a year and uh, exchange ideas, share uh, both uh, wonderful triumphs and also discuss what some of the pain points are around the country about public works. And so he's a great resource. And uh, Chair Kosky, I think if we could invite the group to come forward and they will all introduce themselves, but we are so glad they're here. The mayor came and greeted them earlier when we were having lunch uh, in, uh, in 203, as well as having Meet Minneapolis come over. Because many of you know we have a sister city relationship with the city of Kuopio, Finland, which I will say I have been to on a sister city trip in another role. And uh, it was really wonderful hospitality. And of course, we also have a really great uh, network of both uh, Dutch folks and Finnish people in Minnesota. So we're so glad that you are here today. And we're, I think we're gonna move the, the rope aside and we can come around this side. Okay, great. Thank you so much for having us here. My name, uh, as you heard, is Scott Grayson. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the American Public Works Association. And we actually represent 31,000 people in North, North America, largely in the United States. And, and as was so well explained, we provide education. We, we also lobby in DC and help the passage of the 1.2 trillion in infrastructure spending, which we're so excited about, which is making its way here. And as it happens, I live here too. So, please to be here. Hello everyone, my name is Ville Alatyp. I'm the uh, Street and Park Maintenance Director in the city of Helsinki, capital of Finland. I'm the, uh, also the CEO of the Finnish Association of Municipal Engineering, so I'm the colleague of Scott. And uh, actually one extra point is that the, um, the uh, resident uh, elected on the uh, International Federation of Municipal Engineering. So traveling globally, seeing that uh, we are sharing the same problems around the world. And uh, we are trying to face, we officers, uh, we're trying to seek uh, solutions, global solutions for our public works issues. So, great to be here. Yes, nice to meet you all. I am from the city of Helsinki, a pro project director um, in a public works department. We call it the 
Urban Environment Division. And uh, in City of Helsinki, we have this uh, strategy to go to the world and share best practices so we can learn from e each other. So uh, I am here learning from you and trying to share our best practices. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, George Masonides. I'm from the Netherlands, the only one. And I worked 33 years for uh, Amsterdam Airport Schiphol, responsible for winter operations. And in that period, we developed together with uh, the University of the Netherlands a snowblower, what can compress uh, snow. So you save a lot of money and emissions if you can put two times more snow inside one dump truck. And since 2019, I'm the managing director of Snowcom. And together with the city of Helsinki, we de developed a smaller machine uh, for inside the cities. Thank you. Hello. Um, um, uh, thank you for this great opportunity to find out and check out your uh, the, all the good things that you do here in the U.S. What comes to fleet and winter operations and so on. My name is Jussi Hannola and I work as a fleet manager for Helsinki City. And I think we have a lot of good practices to bring back home. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tommi Lukkarinen. <coughs> I am from uh, Tampere. Uh, you will see Tampere in TV in May because we have the World Ice Hockey Championships. And I'm a mobile software developer, and I'm responsible for most of the uh, electronic tools used by uh, Finnish cities. And I'm here learning how far you have gotten on the same path. Thank you. Hello, everything. Uh, my name is Tuula Smolander, and I'm street manager in the city of the Jyväskylä. Jyväskylä is a small town in the middle of the Finland and I, I am very glad that I can be in here and learn what you are doing in winter. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to stand up here and do a quick picture and just want to say quickly uh, this is very special to me. I, uh, my husband family is from Finland and I am a Dutch woman. So um, it's very nice to be able to welcome you here to our city. So thank you very much. Can you get some on the other side? Sure. Dutch to Dutch. Yeah, where are you? Oh, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, with that, we'll move on to our consent agenda. Uh, there are 14 items on the consent agenda today, which I'll read for the record. Uh, the first is authorizing negotiation of easements for the 2023 Parkway Paving Program and ADA Pedestrian Ramp Program. Next is authorizing a cooperative funding agreement with Hennepin County Regional Railroad Authority for repair of the uh, Martin Sable Bridge over Hiawatha Avenue. Then we had the authorizing a cooperative agreement with Hennepin County for proposed multimodal improvements along Lake Street and Lagoon Avenue. Next, authorizing concurrence with the Shingle Creek Watershed Jurisdictional Boundary Update. And then we have approving an appointment to the Bicycle Advisory Committee. Next, approving an appointment to the Metro Blue Line Extension uh, Community Advisory Committee. Then authorizing a joint powers agreement with the City of Columbia Heights for the 37th Avenue Northeast Re Northeast Street Reconstruction Project, and then we have authorizing an agreement with the Hennepin County for the 37th Avenue Northeast Street Reconstruction Project. And then items number 11 through 14 are approving large block event permits applications for a Cinco de Mayo block event that's going to be held on May 14th, then Art of World to be held on May 19th through the 21st, 
and then the Warehouse District Live to be held on all weekends from May 26th through October 29th. And finally, uh, the Edina Art Fair to be held on June 2nd through the 4th. Um, we have another one here, authorizing permanent and temporary easements for the 15th Street Sanitary Sewer Rehabil Rehabilitation Project. Uh, the next is accepting a grant from the Board of Soil and Water Resources for green infrastructure improvements. And I also understand that staff is requesting a change to the dollar amount uh, in item number nine, that is the joint powers agreement with the City of Columbia Heights uh, for the 37th Avenue Northeast Street Reconstruction Project. Director Anderson Kelleher, uh, who is here to summarize, uh, or who is here to summarize that change? Madam Chair, I'm going to summarize the change for the committee. So initially, the contingency was included in the estimated amount shown that is highlighted. And after discussions with Columbia Heights, the contingency amount added is taken out of that estimate amount. That is why the estimate is actually reduced. The City of Columbia Heights has requested not to pay the contingency amount up front, but rather to pay it after the completion of the project, which is covered within the agreement. So I believe uh, committee members have the amounts noted that uh, 7 million, uh, and then it goes down to 6.4 million. Thank you uh, for that information. Uh, that item will be amended to decrease, to decrease the dollar amount of the agreement, and I will just state it for the record, $7,050,832.48, down to $6,409,847.71. Uh, is there any further discussion on the consent agenda, or are there any items anyone would like to pull for further discussion? I am not seeing any, and so I will move approval of the consent agenda, noting that the amendment to number nine as well. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, say nay. The ayes have it, and the consent agenda is approved. All right, today our first uh, public hearing is considering the Mill District Street resurfacing project. Director Anderson Kelleher, who will be presenting this item today? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, today, Presenting on this item is Larry Matsumoto, Principal Professional Engineer in Transportation Maintenance and Repair. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Matsumoto. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon, Committee Vice Chair and members of the Public Works Infrastructure Committee. My name is Larry Matsumoto, and I am a prin Principal Professional Engineer in Public Works and I am here to present to you the Mill District Resurfacing Project and recommend passage of a resolution ordering the work to proceed in adopting a special assessments in the amount of $447,875.71 for the Mill District Residential Resurfacing Project and passage of a resolution requesting the Board of Estimation and Taxation to authorize the city's issuance and sale of assessment bonds in the amount of $400,000 $47,875.71 for the project. The Mill District is comprised of three individual street segments, 1st Street South, 2nd Street South, and 13th Avenue South, shown on your map. Clerks, I'm not seeing a presentation up. I'm not sure if... Hold one moment, please. Oh, here we go. All right, it's up now. Shown on your map, on March 2nd, 2023, the City Council designated the improvements of the, of the proposed street resurfacing program. The purpose of the asphalt pavement resurfacing program is to extend the life of some city streets which are not scheduled for any preventive maintenance, renovation, or reconstruction in the foreseeable future. This resurfacing program is addressing city streets that are at a point in their life cycle where a new street surface will extend the street's life improve the ride quality and neighborhood livability, and to help slow the overall deterioration of our city street system. The Mill District also has bike new bike infrastructure and pedestrian safety features included with the project. These enhancements are funded from other sources and not paid for by these assessments. The transportation maintenance and repair has worked with transportation planning and programming and transportation engineering design with, on these additional improvements. 
Proposed street surfacing special assessments were determined by applying the 2023 uniform assessment rate to the land of benefited parcels located within the street influence zone along with the approved streets. Information has been provided to the affected property owners in these notices and mailed to them as to how persons may prepay the special assessments in full without interest if they should so choose. City Council has also passed resolutions whereby a deferment of special assessments may be obtained by showing hardship for any homestead or property owned by a person of 65 years of age or older, retired by virtue of a permanent and total disability, or military personnel ordered into active military service. This concludes my presentation and I am available for any questions, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I'm going to proceed to open the public hearing and I'll ask the clerk if anyone is signed up to speak. All right, and if you did not sign up and yet wish to, uh, please see the clerk if there's anybody here. Oh, sorry, yep, you can come ahead and speak here first and then you can sign in with the clerk, my apologies, and we will have a timer and each of you will have uh, two minutes. So go ahead, right. welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is James Haskins. I'm the managing director of the Guthrie Theater at 818 South 2nd Street. Uh, we had received assessments, uh, to a total of eight assessments in the amount of $49,000. Uh, which we felt was an inordinate amount in terms of uh, the, the total uh, project amount that was being assessed to the Guthrie. Um, wanted to bring that to your attention. We also uh, have some concerns about the dual carriage bikeway. We appreciate the fact that in the design process it has been moved from the Guthrie side of the street to the parking ramp side of the street, but we still have concerns about a dual carriage bikeway where we have thousands of patrons who cross between the parking ramp and the Guthrie Theater on a weekly basis, that it will in encourage more bike traffic, but also probably more importantly to our patrons is the scooter traffic. That has already been uh, a problem uh, for uh, patrons in the Mill District at the Guthrie and, in, and sort of encountering scooters. So we wanted to share uh, these concerns with you here today relating to this project. Thank you, appreciate you being here, and just, yes, please just sign in. Will do, thank, thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hi there. I'm Angela from the American Red Cross, and I'm here to speak about our assessment. We have the special assessment amount of $20,000, 885 and 35 cents. We would like to put forward that we are an organization funded solely by donations and this is an unexpected expense and we feel this would cause undue hardship to our operations. We're looking to get a reduced special assessment and explore options for that, possibly being assessed at the lower residential rate instead of the business rate since we don't have the normal revenue incomes as other businesses. Thank, Thank you. you for your time. Just sign in with the clerk. And also, I'm not sure if there is city staff here to maybe address some of her concerns. Um, is Madam Chair, I think that after you close the public hearing, um, Mr. Hadeland and others can step out in the hallway and talk to both parties. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any other, uh, anyone else wishing to speak, so I'll now close the public hearing. Are there any questions from committee members? Not seeing any, I will move approval of this item. All in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. The ayes have it, and uh, this committee recommendation will be forwarded to the next week's uh, council meeting for final action. All right, our second and final public hearing today is considering amendments to code citation in the Water and Sewer Code. Director Anderson Kelleher, who will be presenting? Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Annika Bankston, Director of Water Treatment and Distribution, will be making the presentation today. Welcome, Ms. Bankston. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Director, Madam Vice Chair, and, and committee members. Uh, here, we are here today requesting uh, passage of ordinances amending provisions and portions of the city code. The proposed amendments will eliminate references to previously repealed Title 19 within the code and replace them with appropriate references in the uh, Title 19 Chapter 505 billing. These amendments are necessary to direct users of the code to the correct billing and utility billing information. Uh, in 2022, the City Council repealed and replaced Title 19 and Chapters 505 and 507 relating to billing requirements. And uh, by replacing chapters 505 through 509, made the code more user friendly and readable and accessible to the general population. But as a result of reorganizing the content, it is necessary to correct some cross references in the city code. And amendments specifically are required to uh, sections in three titles of the code, where service charges, administrative fees, or assessments that may be added to the utility bills of customers um, are described. Uh, the portions of the code requiring amendment are in Title 12, 11, Title 12, and Title 19 as laid out in the RCA. Um, again, these are just really clarification of cross-references that need to be updated. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I am going to proceed to open the public hearing. I'll ask the clerk, is there anyone signed up? Is there anyone here who would like to speak on this item? All right, I am not seeing anybody, and I will go ahead and close the public hearing. Are there any questions from committee members? Not seeing any. I will move approval of this item. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, say nay. The ayes have it, and this committee recommends, uh, recommendation will be forwarded to the next week's council meeting for final action. Uh, our first discussion item today is receiving and filing the 2023 Vision Zero Annual Report. Director Anderson Kelleher, who will be presenting this item. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Ethan Fowley, Vision Zero Program Coordinator, Transportation Planning and Programming, will present both the 2023 Annual Vision Zero Annual Report uh, on Infrastructure, as well as he will be presenting the 2023-2025 uh, Minneapolis Vision Zero Action Plan. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, thanks, Chair Kosky, members of the committee. Um, so, as you all know, the city set a Vision Zero goal in 2017 of getting to zero severe and fatal crashes on our streets by 2027. Um, we're, we have two items related to this today. This is a receive and file, and then we're going to have the adoption of the 2023 to 2025 Vision Zero Action Plan as well. A lot of what we're talking about today with the annual report is more about the action plan we've been working through that was adopted in 2019. Um, so the high-level news here is, unfortunately, we're still seeing an increased spike um, in fatal crashes uh, in 2022. Uh, this is a trend that continues across the country, um, although we continue to be a little bit uh, more heightened here locally. Um, and yeah, it, it's very troubling. Um, we, I, every time I think we, like so far this year, we have had one fatal crash, which is terrible, and also an improved trend. And I hope that that continues. Um, unfortunately, we ended last year very poorly in the last few months. Um, so uh, it's, it's still something we're very much looking forward. I'm gonna talk about that just a little bit. Talk about stats. I always do this, right, is we also have to humanize, right? The, the numbers, uh, you know, 20, 23 people, um, dying in 2022, here's some of their names. I'm just gonna share a little, few of the stories too. Um, so a six-year-old uh, was killed by a driver going 94 miles an hour, ran a stop sign on 53rd Avenue North. A uh, 61-year-old father on the way home, his way home from work was killed by a, a driver who ran a red light on Portland Avenue while going more than 100 miles an hour. A 79-year-old was crossing the street with his wife and was hit by a driver turning left from University Avenue Southeast. Uh, similarly, a 76-year-old was killed by a left turn driver while crossing First Avenue South. Uh, a, a woman experiencing houselessness was sleeping on a mattress in an alley and was probably inadvertently run over by a driver and killed. A 24-year-old medical researcher at the university um, was 
hit and killed by a, a driver who ran a red light on University Avenue Southeast at 75 miles an hour. Um, she, moved to, she had moved here from the Bahamas to go to medical school and was described by colleagues as a wonderful soul who brought light to all who knew her. A 22-year-old uh, was killed by a driver going nearly 90 miles an hour who ran a red light on Lindell Avenue North. He was described as a, a gentle giant, an Edison High School graduate. He loved his family, fishing, chess, sports, babies, pets, puzzles, and the outdoors. Now, I don't have everyone's story, um, and, I, and, I, and so I couldn't share them all. Um, and there are many more uh, with the names here and many more people impacted by uh, these tragedies, which we know are unacceptable and preventable. And you see some of the trends just even reflected in the stories there where we see the increase of really high speeds impacting things. And I think about that from, how do we think about that from a system perspective as well? And the reality is that, how do we think about the reality that people were physically able to drive that fast on our streets? And that's something that I think about from a system perspective, like what can we do? Sure, these are reckless actions, but also how are we working to prevent those? And, and it's a big part of our focus. So thank you for that. And my thoughts are with everyone mourning their loved ones. Okay, back to some stats from the stories. Um, so um, I spoke about uh, fatal crashes being up. We also saw um, severe crashes up at um, basically the highest level that we have comparable data which is only the last few years because they changed the, the system for that. But, um, and this is still happening while all crashes are way down. We're still at historically low levels for all traffic crashes in the city and all pedestrian and bicycle crashes. So it's, it's really about like how are we, we're, we're seeing progress in total crashes while seeing you know, the, the increase in these really high speeds leading to more severe and fatal crashes at the same time. Um, we see a continuation of the intensifying disproportionate impacts here. So um, this is just a map of where the severe and fatal crashes happened uh, last year. Um, you can see overall, if we look at our transportation equity priority areas one and two, they had 59% of all fatal crashes um, while having just 28% of the population. So um, we, we still see that in, in, inequitable impact. Um, and as it talked about, the, you know, the percentage of crashes involving clear speeding has just really, as you can see here, just increased a lot since um, 2020, um, and that has continued. Um, so as we talk, you know, those are kind of the, the base reality, and also just transitioning on to just talk about, like, what are we doing? What's the work? What have we been implementing? Um, and the... You can see here, just generally, we've been making a lot of progress on our 2020 to 2022 Vision Zero Action Plan across a lot of different departments. Really appreciate that. I'm going to highlight a few um, recent things from 2020 here now. So first of all, we installed what really is, I think, an unprecedented amount of um, proactive safety improvements last year at more than 141 intersections um, through our Vision Zero Capital Program. We installed uh, what are mostly um, quick build um, with primarily with uh, the uh, flexible post bollard uh, improvements. And you can see some of the numbers here and just like the scale of this citywide. Um, I, we'll talk about this when we get to the action plan portion of the conversation in a minute, but uh, by using those, these materials, we are able to get to this scale and, and really invest proactively and then we can continue to improve safety over time. Uh, we've also had a lot of capital projects continue to move through, and we've been incorporating safety as a big part of, uh, of those. And so there are a lot of these, but um, it's really impressive. I also, we have a lot more coming. We were very successful in getting uh, uh, regional solicitation grants through the Met Council this past cycle, as was Hennepin County. So we have a lot more safety projects coming as well, which I'm really excited about. Um, four to three lane conversions are especially important. Um, and we had uh, two more this last year on Lindale Avenue South and uh, 31st Street East. And we also are working towards some of, uh, on 
some of the more complex uh, roadways in the city coming up as well. So really excited for the progress being made in this area. This is one of our most proven uh, safety measures. Uh, we also have had a big progress on neighborhood traffic calming as well with funding provided by the uh, city council and the mayor um, through the ARPA program. We installed 17 neighborhood traffic circles last year. Uh, we have additional investments coming there uh, as well. And we launched, as you all know, the, the new traffic calming, neighborhood traffic calming process, and which was very popular. And we got 747 applications and we're working through uh, the priorities for 2023 installs. And it's great to just be able to take all that interest and start to make investments there as well. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more this, about this in the action plan uh, section as well, but we've been working to advance uh, towards a traffic safety camera pilot program, including getting legislative authority. Um, and there's more to come here, but um, we've been making a lot of progress. And then, um, uh, as you all know, we, we finished a Vision Zero crash study and we are updating our action plan, which we'll get to in the next item. So that's it for my uh, annual report presentation and I'll pause for that action before moving on to the next one. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, any questions from my colleagues? Councilmember Wansley, you can cue first. Thank you, Chair Koski. Uh, first, Ethan, I just want to say thank you for meeting with my office to discuss um, uh, the Vision Zero Action Plan, specifically, you know, around questions related to the traffic um, calming pilot, pilot that the city is interested in advancing and that the public has shown so much interest in. Um, while I recognize, you know, traffic enforcement, specifically um, traffic enforcement without police officers, is still something. Um, many of our communities are asking for. Um, I wanted to touch base on that camera piece of, you know, really looking at um, how this pilot will impact people's privacy and or unintentionally increase our surveillance. Um, so currently our city does not have a robust policy around surveillance. That's something that I'm working on in partnership with some of our other council members and external partners. Um, but can you touch on or talk about the mechanisms of accountability that will be put in place um, to ensure that data is not abused, that's gonna be captured through these cameras. And then also second question, what will be um, MPD's relationship to data obtained um, by these traffic cameras? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chair Koski, Council Member Wansley, um, if I may, I'm, I have a, several slides oh, in, the, in the, the next part of this related specifically to the traffic sam, uh, safety camera pilot. I'm gonna work to make sure to address your questions as part of that, but please, um, if I miss something, we can come back at that point. Does that, make, uh, does that work? Sure. Yeah. And Madam Chair, if I could, I, I think the important part, um, Councilmember Wansley, and I know that Ethan will cover this, but we do not, if we got the authority, if the legislature granted the authority to implement such a program, we actually would probably have a like something like a year-long process of developing the policy of, of determining who would be the lead on that policy, which it could be public works. There are some issues with data, though, and I'm sure he's going to go through that. But I think that you know your concerns are heard by many, many people, and we want to make sure that we are getting the benefit of that 47% reduction in crashes and not uh, adding to people uh, being surveilled or anything else that would profile mm -hmm. uh, any activity. So that is that is the goal is that we could not, even if we got the authority in this legislative session, there's a long road ahead. I'm glad you shared that uh, commitment. Um, I, again, this is something that we've it, it, uh, reiterated with Ethan from our office, especially if someone was from Chicago where there was a very um, troubling rollout of their um, traffic camera program that did engage in a lot of racist profiling of residents and led to lots of uh, lawsuits in the end too. So just wanna make sure we're cognizant of how other cities have rolled these out, those problems. And it sounds like being thoughtful of how we carry out this particular program here. So thanks for that, that affirmation. Thank you, yes, appreciate the additional context. And Councilmember Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I actually was first wanting to say thank you for bringing those individual stories into this. I think it's really easy to 
lose sight of what we're actually working towards. Um, and I got a little weepy as you were telling some of those stories. So I uh, wanted to say thank you for that. But um, <clears throat> and it sounds like you have some slides and I was gonna ask questions or make some comments about the cameras, but I just, based on this conversation that we just had, uh, I had originally started work around a more comprehensive framework around uh, how the city as an institution evaluates uh, and implements surveillance technology. That's actually technically still in flight. We're still waiting on some analysis from the city's attorney's office, but I just wanted to say, and maybe some of this will be addressed in some of your future slides, but um, we have a facial recognition ban already passed by ordinance. That's a one-time uh, approach to a single type of technology, and what we know is that these types of technologies are evolving really quickly, much faster than our legislative process, I would suggest. And I think what we need to really focus on is a, uh, a comprehensive approach to evaluate new technology, give opportunity for public comment, weigh the benefits and the costs associated with those technologies, and really be thoughtful about how we implement them because Again, when we ground some of these decisions in the stories of lives lost, we can't lose sight of that. And we also can't lose sight of the potential harm that could be caused by, um, you know, whether it's capturing uh, images of people that are, you know, engaged in things unrelated to traffic that might be used against them in a court of law or other civil liberty uh, protections. We just really need to be thoughtful about that trade-off. And I think we talked a little bit about it in our one-on-one, -on -one, just in terms of, I really like the idea of using cameras and minimizing police interactions. What I really don't like is the idea of having a big brother net that can then criminalize just your existence in the world. And so I think we will never be able to draw that boundary on a technology by technology basis. We really need to have a process to do those evaluations every single time. And I'm, I'm hoping that we can reboot some of that work that we already started, but maybe you'll answer some of those questions in the next slides. Thank you for those comments, Councilmember Payne. Councilmember Chukdai. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Foley, thank you so much for coming in and, and presenting on this issue. I, I really deeply appreciate uh, your work on, on Vision Zero and, and our, city's, um, our city's prioritization of, of uh, this type of work. Um, I, I think I remember last year when you came in to present, you also um, went through the list of, of names and shared a little bit about the, the individuals who lost their lives um, as, as a result of of um, preventable traffic um, related um, cases. And um, it just, it's really powerful. Thank you for doing that. I hope you continue to, to make that a practice. It's really important for us to be grounded in, in, in the, the actual people and their lives and their stories, their communities that are impacted by this. Um, I wanna talk specifically about um, I want to talk specifically about the 4-3 conversion on Lindale. Um, in, it's at the border between the Whittier and Lowry Hill East neighborhood. Um, I, I remember when this was implemented last year, I had a, an elderly constituent. Um, his name is Harry, who approached me, and he's, he's, he lived right off of Lindell for forever. And, um, and I remember he said, like, who did that? Because it saved my life. And um, it just was one of the most meaningful things I've I've heard, and it's it's it was that was the point of of this four three conversion, um, at least it was to me. Um, and then a, a few months ago, um, another constituent of mine reached out. Her loved ones reached out. Um, her name is Melanie Garcia, and uh, she was. Um, visiting with one of her friends uh, on the 26th and Lindale intersection and was hit by a vehicle um, speeding. And I think they, they broke up, ran through a red light. Um, and 
she is thankfully alive, um, thankfully has health insurance and, um, what, you know, spent several months in the hospital is going to have a lifelong struggle with rehabilitation, um, from such a severe injury that, that she suffered. Um, so that those two stories kind of remind me of, it was really important for us to make these changes on, on Lindale. The 4-3 conversion is, is a critical thing. It is saving lives and it's going to save lives. But there are additional changes that need to be made. I'm wondering if you can speak to um, like the, 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 the tools the city has to influence additional traffic calming measures on, um, on Lindell Avenue South, where this is still a pilot and there, there could potentially be other um, measures implemented. Yeah, uh, Chair Kosky, Council Member Chugtai, thank you for the question. Um, we were really very happy to partner with Hennepin County on the on the pilot four to three on safety conversion on Lindale Avenue South this year. And you are right, we, we do have more work to do there. Uh, thankfully, one of those projects that was funded through the regional solicitation is Lindale Avenue South. Um, so there's gonna be a future street reconstruction coming uh, there. And so we'll be partnering again with uh, the county on building a lot of those you know, additional measures, safety measures into that project. I think when you, you think about the Hennepin Avenue design, which is not too far away, um, you know, we did a lot of additional safety things with a median and you know, access control, but also um, you know, bike and pedestrian safety improvements there. So uh, there's a lot of tools that we can bring in as part of a street reconstruction project that are maybe beyond what you can do in a pilot um, in the short term. So yeah, we're really excited for that future. It's really gonna be an important part of uh, decision making there. Wonderful, thank you very much. Thank you. Not seeing any other uh, questions from my colleagues. I will direct the clerk to file this report. I also wanna note that we've been joined by Vice President uh, Lene Palmasano as well here. And our final, uh, oh, sorry, before that, my apologies. I just jumped through this, getting through all these things. But I also want to just thank you so much for uh, just noting and um, listing the names of those that we've lost. Uh, unfortunately and sadly, the single fatal uh, fatality is, was in my neighborhood. Uh, Mr. David Norris was struck um, in January of this year and he was walking around Lake Nokomis, and that case is still open. And so um, just want to say thank you so much for just making sure that we continue to remember these lives. He was a librarian at St. Kate's, 39 years old, and uh, again, I think a preventable uh, crash that we could be doing, so I appreciate this work, and I know now we are, this kind of rolls us into the action plan here, so uh, the next thing on our agenda is uh, discussing the Vision Zero Action Plan. Oh, and we also have Councilmember Monsies. Hold on one second. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Kasi. No, you sharing your testimony. I think I definitely have tried to block this out, but knowing one of the victims of the motorcycle uh, crash back in August, I believe, um, I actually discovered them. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. That was very hard um, in the community that was there when the crash was happen happened and trying to support what we will learn would be the the deceased victim was very tra tra traumatizing. Um, so it does make me think we're trying to do a lot of work on council with our partners and performance uh, management and innovation around advancing victim services. Because one of the most immediate things that my office could think of at that time was working with the Office of Neighborhood Safety. And I want to commend um, Director Josh Peterson for um, supporting our office and getting access to restorative justice services that we went and canvassed around the site of the accident just to let our neighbors know um, that, you know, there's support for them. Um, so just thinking of ways in which we can link um, the survivors and the family members that you mentioned who are still in mourning or those who even bear witness to these tragic incidents um, towards some of those broader victim services that we can absolutely provide in a more formalized um, sense. And I think that's what our office is working on in partnership with our colleagues, but knowing that we have um, 
a great resource with the Office of Neighborhood Safety that can support some of that work too. So I did want to uplift it. I tried a lot to block that out because that was a very traumatic situation, but knowing how that intersects with some of the victim service work too. Yeah. Um, thank you, uh, Chair Kosky, for your story and Councilmember Wansley for your story as well. I'm sorry for all that, that trauma. And um, we do have a couple things around restorative justice pieces that we've included in the uh, Vision Zero Action Plan, but I, I really uh, like your ideas and I think there's even more we can potentially look at in the future. So really appreciate those thoughts and um, thanks for sharing that uh, traumatic story. Thank you, Mr. Pauly. Before you continue on, I see Director would like to say a few words. So Madam Chair, I really thought about where to say these words, but I wanna thank Ethan and I wanna thank his team. And I wanna thank everyone who works on this issue. This is a very hard issue to work on. It's you know largely preventable to these crashes, but the outcomes of these crashes are tragic and we cannot lose sight that the reason we do this work in public works, one of the reasons I came here to Minneapolis is that we can make progress on protecting the most vulnerable users of our roadway. And that is why many of us get up and do this work every single day. We need to make sure people have safer routes and that they can feel safe and be safe. And that matters if you are a child, that matters if you are an aging person, that matters if you're just visiting our city as well. And so I wanna thank Ethan because I know how much he feels this work and I know how much his team feels this work and I wanna thank them for everything they're doing. Thank you, Director. And Councilmember Vita. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, everyone has said almost everything I wanna say, but I wanna thank you, Ethan, because I know you started this work a really long time ago and you're still at it and I'm so proud of you for continuing at it. I remember the first time we had a meeting about what Vision Zero was and um, we're still having people die. We had Josiah in my ward, who you acknowledge today. I've spoke with his mother, Desiree, several times about that extremely tragic accident. I went to the scene and saw what happened, and that was just so unfortunate. It really was. And so thank you for acknowledging the people who have lost their lives due to these very tragic accidents. And I just want to encourage you to keep at it. You know, if anyone can get us down to zero, it's going to be you, Ethan, and your team. So keep at it. I appreciate you, and I support all the work you do around this. Thank you. All right, Thank you all for the very nice comments. <laughs> not seeing any other comments uh, right now. I'll let you continue on with your presentation. Okay. Now, yeah, well, now we're going to talk about the reality is we can get to zero, right? And, and we are working with urgency to make progress there. And our 2023 to 2025 Vision Zero Action Plan is our way of showing what are the key things that we're focused on. Um, so I presented the draft of this uh, action plan back in November. We had a, a public comment period, and now we're bringing forward the final plan. I'm going to, for today, just highlight some of the things we highlighted in engagement just to ground everybody. Um, and then uh, I'll talk about some of the changes, some of the feedback we heard, and some of the changes we've made for the final version coming to you all here. Um, and so let's start there. So uh, continuing to make um, proactive safety improvements focused on our highest uh, injury streets, our high injury streets as we call them. So we do have our Vision Zero Capital program, but we're also uh, seeking, again, we were un un unfortunately unsuccessful in getting a, safe, a federal Safe Streets for All grant this last year, but we've uh, gotten some really good feedback and we are gonna be bringing an, uh, 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 another action for you all to reapply um, for that funding, which really a, a, is a big chunk of our work here is moving from these quick build improvements, but also upgrading to full concrete and additional safety investments. And we have our updated high injury street map here, you can see on the screen where we'll be focusing those investments. So more to come there in a lot of different areas. Um, we're also, we, I talked about speed and those stories and, and then the data. Um, and so we're really looking at what are the things we can do from public works side to address that dangerous speeding in a lot of different ways. Um, and we've found some encouraging things and want to continue to keep um, working towards those and finding more. Um, the speed safety camera 
uh, pilot and uh, was in the draft version, and we're, now we're, kind of, uh, we're talking about more broadly as just traffic safety camera pilot. Um, and I'm gonna talk about this just a little bit more, but I wanna just acknowledge that that was one of the things we highlighted in engagement around the draft plan. Um, and then the, the, the fourth piece that we highlighted is really uh, recognizing the reality around uh, traffic enforcement uh, in the city um, with the dual pieces of traffic enforcement is way down. And we know that this is part of the, the, the conversations with the State Department of Human Rights and, and others. So we're, we're working on both sides of that. And a big part of that is finalizing a study of potential alternatives around that work. So those are some of the highlights. What do we hear from folks? We, uh, we got 170 comments on the um, draft Vision Zero Action Plan. I want to first of all just acknowledge that this was um, primarily through online means. So um, I want to acknowledge that I wouldn't expect this to be wholly representative of the entire city of Minneapolis. Just you know, uh, recognizing that we did make it. Uh, we had some other engagement leading up to our comment period as well that reached a lot more people. Um, and we know also that we want to engage on those key details in the future even more robustly. Things like traffic safety camera pilot, you know, those kind of details. So um, as you can see here, just summarizing, we had more uh, support than opposition to all those key strategies within the plan. Um, you can, uh, I'll sp spend a little more time on the speed safety camera pilot and traffic safety camera pilot because, you know, that was where we've heard the most, you know, questions, right? And so I want to be able to talk about that a little bit. Um, so some of the things we heard on that pilot was supporters really thought it would improve safety, but we heard concerns about surveillance um, or it people thinking it was unconstitutional. Um, we also heard some interest in red light cameras as well. We really, um, well, I'm going to highlight some of the, what we tried to build in protections on this. So you all are like just clear on what we're, we've been working on and hopefully that addresses some of the questions and concerns um, uh, that came up earlier as well. And we have adjusted some things in the, the final plan just to be clear about traffic safety cameras more broadly, which gives us flexibility around speeding and, uh, or, uh, or red light running. Um, so let me just talk about a few details there. First of all, we've been working at the legislature on this. We have a, 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 a we're supporting a bill that was introduced this session, House file uh, 2098 and Senate file 2026. Um, and that bill is not gonna pass this year. Um, we uh, did not have, there were a lot of priorities in the Judiciary Committee and we weren't gonna be able to make it through by deadline. So I uh, just wanna be clear on that, but the, um, we are hopeful of progress in 2024. Um, we, it would, the bill did not stall because of opposition, it was more about timing realities. And so um, I also included on here, MnDOT just released a, um, kind of an analysis of traffic, uh, speed safety cameras in particular. And in that, um, they, they looked at all the research done on this topic in the United States, and they, every methodological, methodologically sound study of US speed camera systems have found reductions in deaths, injuries, crashes, and speed, every single one. And so, you know, this is a very proven tool, and I also have to just acknowledge, Councilmember Wansley spoke of Chicago program, there are programs in the United States that I don't think meet the the, the uh, our values and what we bring through our racial equity uh, framework and transportation and the city's goals around equity in a lot of different areas. How do we take from the best ones, learn and build to make sure it reflects our values here in Minneapolis has been a very important part of our work here. So I did wanna just share a few details around this. Um, so we are focused on changing unsafe behavior while protecting fairness and equity. So when we think about getting those results while making sure we're, you know, we're being fair and equitable, we have some things that have been done other places. So first of all, speed camera violations would only come in at 10 plus miles an hour over a speed limit. So if you happen to go 31, you're not gonna get a ticket in a 30 or you know, 26 in a 25. But if you're going 35 in a 25, you're gonna get a ticket. And what's that ticket gonna be? Well, first of all, you're gonna, you're gonna we have a, we'll have a one month warning period your first violation is gonna be a warning. And so again, our goal is to change behavior, it's not to punish people. Uh, then after that, you're gonna get a $40 ticket every time. Um, you can take a traffic safety class that's free in lieu of one ticket. Again, we're trying to change behavior, we're not trying to, uh, to punish people. And the violations do not go on your driver's record, except um, we have to do it for CDL holders by federal law. Um, so it's not gonna impact your insurance rates or, 
or anything like that. It cannot be grounds for revoking or suspending a driver's license or for arrest. Um, and then, you know, we're trying to change behavior, so all locations have to have advanced signage and be listed publicly. And so that's basically, you know, because uh, speed cameras are so, uh, traffic safety cameras are so effective because you know if you do it, you're going to get the ticket where officer enforcement, you can never have that cer same certainty. And who wants to get a $40 ticket every day in the mail while they drive by the same location? They're going to change their behavior. That's just the reality from other cities. And just as a note, New York has a similar, very, city has a very similar approach. 87% of people who gets, uh, never get a second speed camera ticket in New York City because they change their behavior. So when we talk about pr protecting privacy, um, there are a lot of aspects to this. I'll talk about some of the that are built into the, the bill, the state level. Cameras can only be used for traffic safety enforcement. That's specifically part of the state bill. Um, the cameras can only take a picture of a back license plate. Um, they can't take a picture of uh, any, any, um, any, in any way that is, you're taking a picture of somebody's face. You have to, it's only for uh, that and only for the uh, uh, safety enforcement. And then we, so you can see some other details here. We also like have worked to build in at the state level, what are the state best practices around data privacy and data management to protect against uh, concerns there. And I also think there's gonna be more that will have to be done at the local level around that issue, but we're trying to build a lot of that at the state level as well. Um, and so that speaks to, Director Anderson Keller spoke to kind of the, the year-long process once there is legislative authority to develop a local pilot. Um, there's a lot more that will have to come in at the local level. Um, and we have said in the plan that that needs to be informed by really robust community engagement and making sure that we're meeting people where they are across culture and background, all areas of the city. And then, you know, that will get to a lot of those questions came up, which departments are managing and involved in the program, budgetary staffing details, all of that ordinance details, number of loca and location of cameras, making sure we're doing that equitably as well. And so there's a lot to come here. I know we haven't talked about this broadly at the city council before, so we wanted to take the opportunity to get into a few more of those details given the questions that we've heard leading up to here. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Um, and I think, um, I think I addressed most of the questions that came up earlier, um, but I, um, you know, I, I think the data protection pieces, I just wanna acknowledge um, at the state level, there's um, pieces we're building in on data retention requirements. Like the data is not even gonna be retained unless there's a violation. And so the, the, the camera's not taking a picture unless there's a violation and then it's only of the back license plate. And that's the only thing that triggers it. It's the only thing it can be used for is that processing. And then, and then I think we will have to work out those systems at the local level of how are we making sure that that data and the connection then to like, okay, who gets, who's the owner of the vehicle, who gets the ticket, how are we being uh, responsible with that data? Um, so that will be more a local detail, but there are some provisions in the bill to manage around that. So hopefully that helps. Um, okay, I'm gonna go really quickly through. We got some feedback around high injury streets and maintenance and, and, and whatnot as well. We've added some actions in the final plan around uh, maintenance and attractiveness of bollards. Um, so uh, more to come on that. Oops. Uh, we also, we have uh, passed, we've all adopted the racial equity uh, framework for transportation. We've updated the plan to reflect that. Um, we've expanded some, we have a few other actions listed here. Um, one I will note is we've added specifically an action recognizing the work to create a victim-centered restorative justice option uh, for traffic crash cases. So uh, that's something that the city attorney's office has been working on and, um, and we wanted to make sure it's reflected in this plan. So um, I think there's even more we can do there, but a, a starting point for some of that. Um, so that's my quick overview and uh, happy for any other questions that might not have been covered already. So thank you. Thank you so much and I appreciate uh the thorough information, especially, I'll be curious to see these what the bollards look like because so that I definitely get the, those questions <laughs> in Ward 11. All right, Councilmember Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, we discussed this also during our one-on-one -on -one briefing, but I just wanted to bring that conversation into the public. Uh, 
uh, and it, it's kind of addressed in your slide there, but I just wanna like really highlight this, the importance of the funding mechanism of these cameras. And so uh, the conversation we had was around other jurisdictions that were basically doing a revenue share to help pay for the cameras. And that created this perverse incentive to uh, increase the number of tickets because that was how that vendor was able to make their money. And so I think you were pretty clear in our one-on-one, -on -one, but just wanna highlight this for the public that uh, even the, the, the funding mechanism that we use in terms of bringing, implementing this type of technology matters as well because we, what we want to do to your point is change behavior, not punish people or, and not have it be a source of revenue generation for the city that ultimately kind of has this perverse incentive to just continue ticketing people and make it as sensitive and aggressive as possible. So, uh, and I don't know if you had any more to say to that. Yeah, um, Chair Kosky, Councilmember Payne. Um, one of the things that's built in the state bill is that you cannot have a, a revenue generating, a, a contract with a, a, a third party where they are paid based on tickets or revenue produced. Like that, that would be illegal as part of the state bill. And that's to address some concerns that have, have existed in other programs around the country where there has been that incentive even for private companies to even want more ticketing. And so, uh, and then I, I think you're right that a lot of those details, like how many cameras, what's the balance for a pilot to start with, right? And, and how are we um, seeing those changes? But also, I think about also what's the feedback loop for us in public works, right? Where we, uh, we're getting to additional safety improvements on those streets and they reduce the speeds so you have fewer tickets, right? Like all of those things are, I think are a really important part of the local um, piece of that pilot. And that, as a follow-up, maybe a feedback loop that we should consider is this will generate revenue if it's implemented, right? And do we want to put some controls around what that, like that could technically lead to enterprise fund level revenue. And we should maybe be thoughtful about where those dollars go and what they're used for. And a thought process that kind of comes to mind is how much more we could use in the traffic calming budget. And ultimately what we're trying to do is slow people down either through road features or technology. If there's a technology that's generating revenue, we should be, we should think about dedicating that revenue towards traffic calming or other types of investments towards that shared goal of getting to vision zero. So that's just a thought that came to mind. Thank you, Councilmember Wansley. Thank you, Chair Kosky. Um, so I just had a quick question regarding um, actually strategy four um, in the safe streets uh, section, which reads, uh, four, I think it's 4.1. It states, manage community traffic safety requests in a transparent, consistent, and equitable way through neighborhood traffic calming program. Um, again, I know this is a widely welcomed and well-received program over the past year, um, and there was significant interest, as you know, demonstrated with the over 700 applicants for the program across the city. Um, I know that there was also significant critique that the city did not adequately fund this. So I just wanted to know, um, since this is gonna be a top strategy for Safe Streets, how will Public Works prioritize funding for this strategy? And should council expect an increase in uh, a change item then for 2024? Yeah, uh, Chair Kosky, Councilmember Wansley, and um, I'll, I'll just speak, and then and Director Anderson Kelleher might have things that she wants to add as well. but. Um, Within our plan, um, I would say first of all, like our number one priority is addressing those high injury streets. So to make the most safety improvement, continuing to focus investment on proactive improvements on our high injury streets, I'll just be honest, is a bigger priority uh, from us to, to get to vision zero than neighborhood traffic calming. Both are important. And so I, I think we are you know, reflecting that by investing in both. And um, we, you know, with the new neighborhood traffic calming program, which we're, we're in funding basically internally, um, plus um, using some remaining ARPA funding for this year. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I'll just, I just want to make clear on that note. And so when we come to like our safe streets for all application and other things like that, you're going to continue to see that reality reflected in what we're seeking. 
um, because our goal is to get to zero severe and fatal crashes, and we can, that's where we can make the most difference um, uh, towards that goal. So I, I just want to put that out um, and also recognize that this is an important piece, and we want to continue to make progress on the neighborhood traffic calming side as well. Madam Chair. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair and committee members, I think it, this is a very important point, Councilmember Wansley. I would note that in a city like Minneapolis, even a high injury street is someone's neighborhood street. So thinking about this maybe a little bit in a different way, which is, uh, you know, our, our, um, we, have, we have this dual emphasis, right? We have this emphasis on uh, neighborhood street traffic calming. We also have the higher injury street network. And it is so important that we tackle that. And so a lot of our effort in the last few years and going forward are about the investments in those high injury network streets and the safe streets for all application, which I will just compliment Ethan on. We are working to uh, enhance, hopefully, our ability to win that uh, federal money that will then go into that. I would say that is a net positive. And the reason it's a net positive is if we can tackle with Safe Streets for All a number of our high injury network streets, then we can do even more in neighborhood streets with our existing dollars that we have. And so, you know, we, we have really been able to start to get data through the new traffic calming program, the application, and that is what we told you all. We said what we need to do is we need to get this program underway. We need to understand who who is the street owner, where the where the challenge is, and we need to you know, take that data and then bring forward the solutions. And so that is what we're doing right now. And I can't guarantee there's going to be a request mid uh, two year budget cycle, but I am most certain that public works when we approach the next two year budget cycle will be asking for more traffic calming as well as high injury street money, because that is where we can make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for providing somewhat of a approach that you're thinking and in, in funding this it is something that this body should be aware of, um, especially as we go into budget season and also thinking, you know, council member Chuck Tight, you led the way for the council to make additional investments into this last year so that we could start meeting um, just the large scale of demands uh, for this particular um, program that we're offering to also, you know, supplement the larger policy initiatives to make all of our streets safer. So that is something that this body should be cognizant of and really look forward to. Hopefully it sounds like uh, a report coming to Public Works that will give us a synopsis of what that data has shown around the traffic calming program. Um, I had another question in regards to strategy six, um, which states it, you know, engage with community members proactively on street safety improvements while moving quickly to make streets safer. Um, so this is a important goal to have, but I do wanna amplify concerns from residents in the community that in the last year and a half, there have been, um, it, or it seems like there's been a disconnect in how Public Works utilizes that engagement information that community, community members go out their way, take time off of work, try to find folks to watch their kids to, to provide to the city. Um, so it, it seems like, Often, are we really taking um, the level of expertise and experience that our community members are providing in these sessions serious? So as it relates to Vision Zero, uh, Zero can you explain how, I will name, it's broken trust. We're about to go into the discussion around Bryant Avenue very shortly after this. But um, can you explain how you all are thinking of approaching um, and reconciling that broken trust um, that can help lead to some actionable change? Yeah, uh, Chair Kosky, Councilmember Wansley, and uh, I'll start, and I think, uh, <laughs> you want me to start or you want to start? Well, Madam Chair, I'm not sure Mr. Fowley should have to answer <laughs> that question. So, uh, Madam Chair and Council Members and Councilmember Wansley, uh, we will have the Bryant presentation here in a little bit, and I think it's fair to say that you should all look critically about the elements of that plan. Um, we believe that every single safety element is addressed in the plan. 
and we will get to the reason why we've had to make the change in phase two. But I don't think that's Mr. Fowley's question to answer. There'll be my question to answer when we get to the Bryant presentation, as well as Ms. Hager's and mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Elwood's. I just want to note it, uh, Director Mack, in terms of this is also, it's, it hasn't just started with Brian. I'm naming that there has been continuous, you know, vocalization from the public about changes in some of the work that Public Works is leading after there's been these thorough engagement sessions. So just naming, even before Bryan Avenue, there is that broken trust there and thinking of how is Public Works looking to um, do some of that reparative work um, so that that can hopefully change how all of the projects that you all are leading um, can be more so trusted and receive, I think, you know, more positive, positively from the public. So I think it is not just isolated to Brian. I know that segues into it, but those will impact how we do this work around Vision Zero since that is a key strategy. Community engagement is named in here. So we want to show that we're being responsive to, towards those concerns that the public has raised, not just around Bryant Avenue, but for a number of projects that's led by Public Works. All right, not seeing any further uh, questions. Oh, or sorry, Councilman, okay. Uh, we will move to approve this item. For all those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Ayes have it, and this committee's recommendation will be forward to the next week's council meeting. Thank you so much, Mr. Fowley, and really appreciate it. And like Councilmember Vita said, if anybody can get us to zero, it's you. So thank, thank you. you. Very much. All right, so next we have our walk-on item today. It's to receive and file an update on the Bryan Avenue South Street Re uh, Reconstruction Project. I believe the presentation will be around 15 minutes and then I will uh, allow another 15 minutes for questions and I'll be prior prioritizing the council members that uh, have Bryan Avenue in their in their wards. So, uh, Director Anderson, who will be presenting, I see she's already come up, but. So, thank you, Madam Chair, and I just wanna say a couple words too before Ms. Hager uh, starts, but uh, Jenny Hager, who's Director of Transportation Planning and Programming, who uh, I think all of you remember that TPP uh, does design work uh, up to the 30% mark, and then it goes over to Transportation Engineering and Design, which is Mr. Elwood's group, and he is also in the audience today. I will also note, and I don't know if he's able to come back right now, but he will be on the public meeting tonight. Fire Chief Brian Tyner was in the room, and that's an important part of this change that you will hear about. I wanna just say for the council members, uh, as well as the public, I think that what we could have done better here is we could have communicated earlier that we were alerted to a number of issues on the phase one implementation of Bryant Avenue. I believe that the recommendations that are being made here by our professional staff, both planners and engineers, absolutely fit into that 30% design that council approved. And I think that Ms. Hager will show you that. Um, but we do have to be responsive to particularly the life safety issues here. And we were very, sort of very quickly into the winter alerted by both fire and EMS that they were having significant issues on phase one of Bryant. And so that is the number one reason we are here. And you will see, I believe, that all elements of the design are here in the plan, and it will be a safer street for all. I recently went and drove the entire thing. I think phase one is a, an amazing design. It is cutting edge, probably the most cutting edge street in the state of Minnesota. But it also has to work when it comes to life safety. And so the changes that are going to be presented today, I believe, get us there. And it still is probably the second most cutting edge street in the state of Minnesota and one of the most in the country. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Hager. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair, committee members. Thank you, Director Anderson Kelleher. Um, so introductions have been done, so I will move right into the presentation today. Uh, the Bryant Avenue project is a two and a half mile reconstruction of Bryant Avenue between 50th Street and Lake Street. The project also includes modifications to intersections along Lindell Avenue, 
between 50th Street and 33rd Street. Work began in 2020 with concept development and community engagement. Construction will be substantially complete by the end of this current construction season. Project goals include improving pedestrian safety and comfort, creating an all ages and abilities bicycle connection, supporting existing and future transit service, using green infrastructure to collect and treat stormwater runoff, and accommodating business deliveries and customer access. The project concept layout was approved by City Council in August of 2021. The Bryant Avenue design was one of the first developed under the guidance of the Transportation Action Plan and the Street Design Guide. The design includes several innovative design treatments and creative solutions to the challenges presented by such a constrained corridor. We've learned a lot from this project so far and we expect to continue learning. Bryant Avenue has a right-of-way width of 60 feet. However, after considering existing encroachments into the right-of-way, the effective right-of-way width is 55 feet. Our transportation action plan tells us that Bryant Avenue is on our pedestrian priority network and our all ages and abilities bicycle network. Our safety data tells us that while Bryant Avenue is not a high injury street, the corridor does have a crash history. Prior to the reconstruction project, Bryant Avenue was generally a 40 foot wide street with travel lanes in each direction and parking on both sides of the street. Sidewalks were directly adjacent to the curb. There was no bikeway there was no green space within the right-of-way. The approved concept layout for the project included two typical cross-sections representing areas with two-sided parking and areas with one-sided parking. In both typicals, the concept layout includes dedicated space for pedestrians and bicyclists, a protected curb-separated bikeway, a narrowed street section with eight foot parking lanes and a, twen a 10 or 12 foot drive lane and green boulevards to support street trees and green stormwater infrastructure. The concept layout also includes safer intersection designs that shorten crossing distances for pedestrians and provide more comfortable crossings for bicyclists chicanes which contribute to safer vehicle speeds and provide additional green space. The concept layout calls for operations along the corridor to change from two-way to one-way with a convergence point at 46th Street. By converting to one-way operation, additional space is gained to accommodate the improved pedestrian realm including green space and to include the bikeway. Phase one of the project included Bryant Avenue between 50th Street and 42nd Street and the intersections along Lindell Avenue. Phase one was constructed in 2022. Phase two of the project includes Bryant Avenue between 42nd Street and Lake Street and will be constructed this summer. Public Works started to receive feedback from emergency services providers, our own staff, and neighbors on phase one of the project before the end of last year's construction season. The issues with the design of phase one were becoming apparent even before we had snow on the ground. The historic snow amounts this winter further exacerbated those issues. Providing for emergency vehicle access is about life safety and is a fundamental requirement of our streets. Our fire department experienced times where they could just barely drive along the street. Had they been responding to an emergency, their response time would have been negatively impacted. They also experienced at least one time where they could not get down the street. The truck in this picture is backing down the street because it could not pass through. Public Works staff had a difficult time as well, reverting to pickup trucks with plow blades instead of our larger plow trucks. We're often asked, why doesn't Public Works simply plow curb to curb? Streets are plowed edge to edge. However, to really move snow up, over, and beyond behind the curb requires more speed than a plow can safely gather on our city streets. As winter progresses and multiple snowfalls occur, snowbanks or berms 
form along the curb lines, and over time, those snow berms further narrow the street. In this photo, parking is allowed on both sides of the street. The white vehicle, which is very close to the driveway and may not be legally parked, prevents someone from safely pulling out of their driveway and turning right to travel down the street. The vehicles parked across the street, while legally parked, prevent someone from safely backing out of their driveway. No snow on the ground. During the winter, the challenges with driveway access grew. The vehicle parked on the street is legally parked. Even without snow, the maneuver for this homeowner is challenging. Snow banks exacerbate the problem by tightening up the space. In many instances, drivers resorted to using the bikeway to access their driveways. Winter parking restrictions helped. However, these tire tracks show that drivers require more space to drive in and out of their driveways than what was provided with the design. In order to balance the parking proposed in the concept layout, parking alternated between the east and west sides of the street with two-sided parking proposed in higher density and commercial nodes. Left or driver's side parking proved challenging as cars were often encroaching into the travel lanes. Winter conditions exacerbated this issue as people needed to park further away from the curb in order to avoid snowbanks as they entered and exited their vehicles. Given these challenges, Public Works is proceeding with design modifications for phase two of the project. We know this feels fast because it is. We've been receiving feedback since last fall. In January, we identified the need for design revisions. In February and March, we mobilized our team to begin looking at options for design revisions and determining what would be feasible. We were coordinating with emergency services providers and our design experts, as well as our contractor. In late March, decisions were made on the revised design and work began to update the design plans. This was late March. We began communicating on these changes as soon as possible. We could have done a better job in communicating. The revised design aligns with city policy, including the Transportation Action Plan, our Complete Streets Policy, Vision Zero, and design guidance contained in the Street Design Guide. The revised design retains as much of the original design as possible and is consistent with the council adopted concept layout. It does not substantially change what is included in the project. It maintains pedestrian and bicycle modal priority in the corridor. It maintains traffic calming and safety design features while improving access for emergency vehicles. It can't be overstated that the design of our streets must provide access for emergency services. That is a life safety factor. We are balancing that against the life safety aspect of our Vision Zero goal in designing our streets to improve safety, especially for our most vulnerable users. The revised design includes sidewalks with plantable boulevards next to them, a protected curb separated bikeway that is with a three foot buffer between the bikeway and the street, a 12 foot drive lane, and eight foot one sided parking on the right or passenger side only. The revised design is very similar to the original design. The primary difference is swapping the location of the boulevard and bikeway along the east side of the street. Another difference is removing any areas of two-sided parking along with any left or driver's side parking. The revised design continues to provide dedicated space for pedestrians and bicyclists, a protected curb-separated bikeway, and traffic calming with a narrowed street and one-way operation. Swapping the location of the boulevard and bikeway is key to improving access for emergency vehicles. The curb that separates the street from the buffer and the bikeway will be a five inch high curb. It's a barrier curb with a near vertical face 
not a mountable curb with a face that has a shallow slope. Our typical curb height is six inches. That one inch difference is enough to allow emergency vehicles such as fire trucks to drive up onto the curb if needed in order to bypass an obstruction in the street or set up their rigs to respond to an emergency. The original design doesn't allow for this because the boulevard is at the back of the curb. The revised design maintains the bikeway at the same level as the sidewalk, same as the original design. The bikeway will not be at the street level. We have gotten questions about snow plowing, especially with the recent historic snow amounts we experienced this winter. Snow plowing is challenging in constrained corridors where space for snow storage is limited. With the revised design, our crews will plow the street toward the west curb and the boulevard space along the west side of the street. They will plow the buffer and bikeway toward the east and the boulevard space between the bikeway and the sidewalk. And snow removal may be needed when there is not enough space for snow storage in those areas. Looking at the revised design and plan view, to the right of your screen is north. This section shows the one-way southbound segment, or one of those segments. Parking is only on the right or passenger side of the street, and the bikeway is on the east side of the street. Again, the revised design is similar to the original design. The primary difference is the redesign of the chicanes to bump outs. Both chicanes and bump outs offer traffic calming benefits and increase green space. Chicanes slow traffic by forcing a horizontal movement of the vehicle. They also help to alternate parking from one side of the street to the other. Bump outs encourage slower vehicle speeds by providing edge friction, similar to a parked car. Another difference is the addition of bump outs near some intersections. These are proposed to help offset any reduction in green space and to ma manage the parking configuration. The revised design continues to provide green space to support street trees and green stormwater infrastructure, safer intersection designs, and traffic calming. With the revised design, parking is estimated to be reduced by 26%. Green space is estimated to be reduced by 13%. These are preliminary estimates that will most likely change as we continue working through design details. To recap, the revised, the revised design maintains designated pedestrian and bicycle space along the corridor, maintains the protected bicycle facility design at sidewalk level with a buffer between the street and the bikeway, maintains traffic calming and safety elements in the form of narrow travel lanes, mid-block features as either chicanes or bump outs, intersection bump outs, and additional bump outs near some intersections. The design adjusts the location of the boulevard green space, adjusts curb lines as needed, will widen driveway aprons, and has parking on the right or passenger side only. There are some details that differ from this typical. We've been asked how the bikeway will transition between phase one and phase two. This is accomplished with a bend out design which moves the bikeway away from the intersection as it approaches 42nd Street, aligning the phase two segment with phase one. The two blocks between 38th Street and 36th Street have reverse flow, a reverse flow bus only lane. No design changes are proposed for these blocks with the exception of driveway modifications. What you see on the screen here is the original design. We've finalized the revised design for the blocks between 32nd Street and Lake Street. The revised design for these blocks will match the rest of phase two. The biggest change is moving to single side parking. 
In both the original design and the revised design, the bikeway width goes from eight feet to 10 feet de depending on available space. The new design maintains the same length of bikeway that is at eight feet versus 10 feet as the original design. We have some additional upcoming meetings where we're sharing this information. So we're here with you this afternoon. A little bit later on today, we're going to be presenting to the engineering subcommittee of our pedestrian advisory committee. A little bit later this evening, we're having a virtual community meeting. It will be recorded and also posted to our project webpage. And next week, we'll be visiting with our bicycle advisory committee as well. We know there are questions about phase one. We're continuing to evaluate options to improve the issues observed in phase one. For example, we do plan to modify driveways in phase one. We'll continue to look at what other options might we might be able to deploy to improve the conditions in phase one. Parking in phase one has been restored to one side of the street. However, we are pulling parking back from the chicanes in order to ensure emergency vehicle access and additional seasonal changes are possible in phase one. This project represents a bold and transformational redesign of this corridor. In partnership with community, we put forward new and innovative design solutions to this tightly constrained corridor. Minneapolis is on the leading edge when it comes to urban street design, certainly in this state, and we are well aligned with our peers across the country. That is what is needed if we are going to reach the vision and the goals of our Transportation Action Plan. We do evaluate our projects, and when something isn't working, we will fix it. With that, Madam Chair, I'll stand for questions. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, as noted, we'll do another 15 minutes of questions, and I'm gonna start with uh, VP Palmasano. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am. I got kicked out of speaker management queue, but I'm happy to yield to anybody else that might be in the queue. Nope, I noted, and I <laughs> talked to Councilmember Tugta, I had time to have you go first since you're sure. needing to get to another meeting too, so. I'd like to point out that my office has received hundreds of emails, dozens of phone calls, and I've had countless conversations at neighborhood meetings and out in the community about the new part, the newly reconstructed part of Bryant. So that's from 42nd Street to 50th and how it's operating in reality. Construction was completed at the very tail end of last year. Construction was completed, but there was still some signage that we were waiting for for supply chain issues. So we really didn't start using the street until like a couple weeks before there was snow. Um, this first phase of the project is entirely in the 13th board. I want to recognize that some of those contacts were about the loss of parking on Bryant. And this is a quality of life issue for those who live on the street, but that's not the topic of our conversation today. And although I hear their frustrations and sympathize about such a drastic loss of parking on a dense corridor and how this affects them on a daily basis, I support the transportation and the climate goals of our complete streets policy. I support our transportation action plan and I am supporting our 2040 comprehensive plan. I'd like to share with you today about the absolute desperation and pleas for help that I've heard from my constituents that live on Bryant Avenue. Those who use the street regularly to get from point A to point B and even from our own city staff. These are the people who cannot access their homes, cannot exit their vehicles safely, and cannot drive down the street because it is so narrow. We've heard city work vehicles and garbage trucks unable to navigate down the street, no place to put garbage carts and for garbage trucks to get down this street for service, fire trucks getting stuck and needing to back down the street as you saw in this presentation, residents unable to make turns in or out of their driveways, inadequate snow removal that makes the street even narrower, and parked cars partially blocking the drive lane due to snow berms. And that's not just a really large snow winter. Um, that's just how it's going to be. The emotions that I hear are from annoyance to fear. Fear. Um, many of the people I've spoken with or heard from are supportive of the bike lanes and the green infrastructure. It's not an either or. They are frustrated with a beautifully executed street reconstruction that looks forward to the needs of the future, but in no way operates effectively or safely in reality. While I'm not happy with that, 
I'm not happy with how we as a city couldn't have predicted that outcome, but I'm really proud of our public works staff who've stepped up and accepted responsibility for this oversight and are working to make it better. Um, the types of modifications that they're suggesting here for phase two, which also part of it is in my ward, the rest is shared with council member Shugtai, uh, they're in direct response to the lived experiences of my constituents. I fully support your efforts to amend this plan for phase two so we don't make the same mistakes again. Your suggested changes do not alter the goals of this plan. It has all of the elements that were in the original concept layout. The traffic calming, slower traffic speeds, ped and bike improvements, and green infrastructure updates. Um, the changes will maintain all of those things and address the deficits that we discovered in phase one. And we've got to learn from our mistakes. So I look forward to seeing the outcome of the modified phase two segment of this project. And I'm anxiously awaiting working together to figure out solutions in phase one that are not going to be a complete redo of the street here, but to help ameliorate the everyday struggles of my constituents in the street. So thank you very much for this presentation. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I think Councilmember Chugtai would like to allow the other council members to speak first. So I'll give each council member five, up to five minutes for question and answers. So Just Councilmember Wansley. Quick thing, Chair uh, Koski. So I know we have our meeting scheduled till four o'clock. So I would hope that we would have more time uh, since it's a discussion-based committee to have discussion and ask questions. So uh, please know it might not stick to five minutes because we're here at least till four. Nevertheless, my questions are for our staff around this. The number one question that my office has fielded about Bryan Avenue is why Public Works was able to make uh, these changes after a council vote um, and mayoral approval. Um, my office reached out to the city attorney's office just to get some clarity on this. Um, and I was concerned to get kind of two different responses on why uh, staff believe you know, this modification did not need to come back to council for a vote. Um, so I also want to know when we reached out to public work staff, um, we were also informed that kind of what you presented, that that modification was not needed for a vote on council because you all felt like it still aligned with um, the project goals. So that being said, I did want to get a sense of you know, the concerning dynamic of we were given two separate answers from two separate departments. And just trying to get a sense of how did each department come to those respective conclusions of us being on the public work side, alignment with, um, you know, the, the project stated goals, but on the city attorney side, I think it was uh, you, city attorney Nelson, that shared some of the text around, well, this wasn't required for a vote. So just want to get clarification on those two different responses. Sure, Chair Kosky, Council Member Wansley. Um, yeah, there, there's, there's, you know, as the legal advisor, um, I will typically stay in my legal lane. And as is the case often with many issues in front of the city, there's a, a, a large policy component that typically will drive ultimately um, decisions around uh, procedure uh, for the most part. Legally speaking, um, no, I don't, the, the code does not require um, the Public Works Department to come before the city for a layout, um, for the approval of modifications to a layout on an existing street. Um, 427.20 only references layout approval by the council in conjunction with new streets. And that same clause of the ordinance continues on to reference actions that can be taken with existing streets. So thus bolstering the, the legislative interpretation um, that, the, that it's not required. Now, um, certainly over the years, um, the, uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, the Public Works Department has come to the city for original layout approvals on reconstructions. I suspect there might be reasons from the Public Works perspective that are tied to, to uh, funding considerations from state or federal funding needing a layout approval, or an original layout approval. Um, but then there are the whole host of other considerations related to good public policy, transparency, Etc. And those are, you know, that I think staff and leadership of Public Works can address those considerations. Um, so, in terms of my answer, and I, I think I reference both that Public Works would have to speak to the changes and the way that those fit within the original layout approval, which was a concept approval. It's a 
it's, it's not a hundred percent as would be a final design. Um, and, 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 um, that those, those changes were part of this presentation here. And I said, I, I suspected it looked like to me a non-public works, non-engineer that they might fit within, uh, arguably fit within that original layout approval. And I think that I've, um, that, that presentation has been made, but then legally speaking, um, I, I do not believe they were legally required to come back mm -hmm. uh, for, the, for, for those modification approvals. I do have a follow-up question on that because I do want to know, um, as many community members have stated, while there seems to be some evaluation that was done around the layout based off of the historic you know, snowfall and some of the issues that you know, homeowners experience with trying to back out of driveways that is warrant the, warranting the modifications that you're proposing. Um, there are a number of community members that are concerned of how this will have a different type of presence going forward for projects. Um, I know that's coming in my ward and other council members' wards. So just on that basis, um, city attorney, can you share what are some uh, kind of recourse or next steps that council can take to address this in the legislative process to make sure that those modifications or changes like that do have to come back for council consideration? Yes, uh, good question. Uh, Councilman Burkowski, Councilman Wansley, thanks for the question. The, the, you know, so I referenced a provision, a part of uh, 427.20, that's in the code. Mm -hmm. So of course this, the city council as a legislative body would have the authority to um, look at a potential amendment to, to that provision. The, I, I don't think it's as simple as changing, um, adding a few words about uh, uh, about amendments returning, you know, there, there, there is a whole host and magnitude of potential amendments um, that can happen after a layout approval, especially on a multi-phase project that occurs over several years, a phased project. And um, uh, so there would need to be some thought. I think it might, you know, it's certainly something that's within your purview, uh, but there would need to be some thought about the approach to that and what types of modifications and how um, that would be defined in terms of changes that would be deemed perhaps material, substantial, significant, that would need to return versus other types of changes that, that uh, perhaps would not. I'm glad that you mentioned that, uh, City Attorney Nielsen. Um, does public work staff currently have kind of uh, a metric of how you quantify then those substantial changes or like any metrics or benchmarks that, you know, are codified somewhere that like kind of pulls the trigger on, you know, we need to make these, these modifications as we're thinking about ways to approach whatever provision. Chair Kasky, Council Member Wansley, Council Members. Um, I think it would be great if Mr. Elwood could step to uh, up because his group, Transportation Engineering and Design, mm -hmm. is where the plan goes after 30%, after approval by the council. And I think one of the questions, and um, Madam Chair, if you'd permit me to just ask a question of Mr. Elwood, I know that's not normal. No, that's fine, thank you. Mr. Elwood, um, how often do you encounter changes after a 30% design approval by city council in any street concept that's approved? Thank you, Chair Kosky, uh, Don Elwood, Director of Transportation Engineering and Design. Your question is how often do we encounter design changes after 30%? Quite a bit. As you, as you get a concept layout, when you get into detailed design, you have to account for where you can put trees, where you can put catch basins, where there's underground utilities that you have to work around. You, you cannot do enough work up front to determine all those fine details. So you get this concept layout that gives me the general direction of where we're trying to get to. What are the elements of the roadway section we're looking to accomplish? What are the features that I'm trying to accomplish? And as we get into design, based on buildings, how close they are to the roadway, what the roadway grade is, the curvatures, if they're straight, if there's a hill, we get into those detailed design. And that's continuous throughout a project. So I hope that answers your question, but it's, it's all projects. So Madam Chair, if I could, I'm gonna answer Councilmember Wansley's question. Perfect. Mm. Every single element that there was public input on, the need for a protected bikeway, the need for a better pedestrian facility, the need for better stormwater treatment, 
the need for slowing traffic speeds, the need for safer intersections. We have followed the design guide mm -hmm. of the city of Minneapolis. We have followed the transportation action plan. Every single one of those elements is here, and that is why we are in within our ability as public works, professional engineers, professional planners, to make the changes. And I will thank you, Director Mack, just um, offer the reason why we're having this public discussion right now is because the public called out the changes and wanted to have a transparent process of why those changes were happening. I'm grateful for Council Member Chuck Ty for working with your staff to get to this point. I think the larger goal was saying, if we could have these more repeatedly for council consideration, and as I mentioned earlier for the first presentation, um, we're seeing this kind of build upon. We were literally here when there was deliberations around the changes to Hennepin Ave. So there's already weariness in the public when it comes to what are perceived to be unilateral changes that do not come forward to this body until after the fact. So I think we're trying to do this point or part of this work of doing that reparative work with the community and also making sure that if there are substantial changes, which is what my original question was, is how are we quantifying those things? That way, when you're making modifications based off of those things, and we can include that in amended language, that can come back to council. That way we can say confidently to our community members when they ask us, well, these are the factors, and they're coming back, and there's a thorough process. That was not laid out a couple of times. So again, I think all of us are trying to be responsive to how we don't end up in this situation again and build that trust with the public and how you carry out your work professionally. So Madam Chair and Councilmember Wansley, if the bikeway had gone away in phase two, if we had proposed no traffic calming elements, we said just drive down the street, no bump outs, no changes to intersections. If we had said something ridiculous, like it's going to be a one and a half foot sidewalk, that's ridiculous, but I'm giving you the example. We would have, as a team, come back to you for a new approval. If we had said, we are going to increase parking on this corridor by 50%, we would have come back to you. Because it would not have been in line with the project goals, Council Member Wansley. Madam Chair, Council Member Wansley. So we had a discussion about this. And I will promise you, if somehow on Hennepin Avenue, there's not a protected bikeway, we would be back to you in a heartbeat. If somehow we could not fit in the major elements that we have come to you at 30%, we would be back to council in a heartbeat. Um, right. Just you. quickly, oh. Chair Koski, just quickly. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned that. I think, again, the public has not seen that consistence, consistently. And what I'm naming is you've made these modifications for Brian Ave. My concern is, as someone who's having projects coming to Ward 2, there's projects in Ward 1, making sure that we are not set up to have the same situation with those future projects. And getting clear, everyone have the same page around what those quantifiable modifications or measures or metrics for modifications are, so that if you do come forward and do similar things in Ward 2, I can communicate that clearly to the public beforehand. So I think that is the thing going forward. I just want to make sure we don't replicate this moving forward with other upcoming projects that's happening all across the city. I will name in my ward because I'm getting questioned. <laughs> by members who saw what happened with Brian Ave and Hennepin Ave and asking, is this gonna happen in Ward 2? So that's the goal on my end. And it sounds like we'll have lots of, lot more conversations around this um, in terms of, again, how we don't replicate these issues. So Madam Chair, I just wanna remind um, council members that Hennepin Ave was a 30% layout design. There was no, there's been no modification since the plan was approved by all of you. We are now in the transportation engineering design phase. So I think we're, um, we apologize for not communicating sooner with the public about the changes that needed to be made on phase two of Bryant Avenue. Council member Palmasano and council member Chugtai have worked tirelessly with us to make sure the elements of this plan and the public input process is honored. And I thank you for that. 
And I just want to say for the public record, I know you're referencing Hennepin Ave bike lanes. I think Consumer it's bus. clear it's around Consumer transportation bus. bus lanes. That's what I'm referring to. So I'm finishing my comments, Chair Koski. Thank you for providing the input and response. And as I mentioned, we'll have ongoing conversations with us, with our city attorneys, um, to make sure we can do things differently going forward. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna go back to my original, uh, everyone will have five minutes, so Councilmember Payne, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. I won't need five minutes, but I will echo Councilmember Wansley and saying we're a deliberative body. This is a committee, we're doing committee work. We shouldn't put time boundaries on that, but I don't think I'll need them. Um, I, I, I just wanna thank you for just kind of upfront saying this, this was a communication snafu, right? I don't think there's any mal intent necessarily unfolding here, but I also share Councilmember Wansley's desire to be able to move through these types of incidents with more deliberation and more proactivity because we're, we're, we're kind of catching up right now with some lessons that were learned earlier and just weren't communicated yet. And I just wanted to connect this to kind of a bigger picture around, uh, you know, this is my first winter season as a council member, I think for Director Anderson Kelleher, I think it, this was your first winter season as the director of our public works department. And I don't know if this existed under previous administrations, but I think there's a real opportunity to have a retrospective approach to how um, we managed. And I mean, this was a, maybe there's not that much to learn from this last season because it was so historical in nature, but I think there's some lessons that probably were learned. They're probably been discussed within the administration. Um, there might be some beneficial aspects to maybe having some dialogue in a public setting around some of those lessons. I know in my ward, um, we had Johnson Street reconstructed and this was the first winter on that um, corridor. And there were some challenges with the shared use path and plowing and the contractor. And um, your team was really responsive in uh, addressing some of those issues. And so I think there's some lessons that were learned over this last storm or last season that we could do a retrospective analysis on and operationalize those lessons in a way that's public and proactive so that we don't find ourselves, if we had that kind of uh, muscle memory institutionally, there could have been an opportunity to talk about the impact of the design on phase one of this and would be proactively getting in front of this so that it didn't feel like a last minute thing. And I think there's a lot of fear and suspicion that there was some business interest that wanted more parking or other types of, uh, and, and it just sounds like you're just trying your best to address uh, some design challenges. So I think this is the big gap here is around that proactive communication and getting ahead of some of this stuff. And I'm hoping that a thing that we could learn from this is how do we communicate those, those, those learnings in a more transparent way so people to Council Member Wanlis's point, really trusts you when you show up with these types of modifications. And I just wanted to put that out there. Chair Koski. Yep, go ahead. Council Member Payne, I think this is an excellent point. We actually are not out of the winter season yet. So I hate to tell everyone that, but we could still technically have snow. Um, we have routinely in public works after we have a major incident, uh, just like we have learned in the public safety side of this organization, do sort of an after action. And I believe we'll do uh, internally, not with everyone, but internally we will do an after action sort of analysis of this winter and what could have been done better. The other thing I want to point out that we are trying really, um, you know, Mr. Dodds is not here. He's out with the Finnish delegation uh, touring right now. We ask him to do that. He is really working very hard to have, um, and our two leaders actually up here with Mr. Powman are working together and then bringing in our public safety folks like fire to be able to analyze a design ahead of time, to actually go out to the street and to lay it out. We do this uh, fairly often in my experience in a year. I think some of you have experienced this, where the team will go out and actually kind of mark off what's happening or what may happen in a reconstruction. I think we missed this one. And I don't know if that was because of the pandemic and everything that was going on, but 
it was definitely missed to be able to understand the needs of fire and Chief Tyner's back in the room and he could speak to that for sure. But we also wanna make sure transportation maintenance and repair uh, is involved in making sure that our streets work uh, for maintenance and repair as well as solid waste and recycling. So it's an excellent point. We will be doing that with this winter season, but we also going forward are trying in our design phase to include more of our operational partners to be able to try to identify where we're going to have a pain point earlier. Now, I, I would love to invite you to have at least, uh, you know, if you're going to do an internal after action, it might be a very technical and very detailed and maybe not that much of a public interest, but consider maybe like a summarized version of that that we could invite you back for. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I think that uh, I will talk to Chair Johnson about how we can work with the public works team to do that. And like you said, maybe a summary of of the the pieces and not not so uh, technical but something that we can digest and understand all right comes Miller took tie thank you madam chair um, mr. Elwood miss Hager thank you so much for coming in today I really really appreciate it I know that you've been working really hard on this um, and as you know you were going through the presentation miss Hager in particular um, I, I just deeply appreciate your acknowledgement of where things went wrong here. And I, I know we've had conversations with one another about that, um, but I know it means a lot to me to see that done publicly. Um, and, and I hope it will resonate with residents um, and, and be a part of reestablishing and rebuilding community trust, which is ultimately what all of this comes back to. Um, I'm going to ask you just a few questions and then I'll end with um, some comments about what all of this means. Um, the, I, I think this was made clear in your presentation, but I want to come back to it because I think it's important. The placement of the bikeway. Um, our office received uh, a lot of concerns from residents about um, the moving the green space. Um, oh, thank you for these uh, original and phase two uh, comparisons. So the moving of that green space from in between the drive lane um, to the other side of, um, of the bike facility. And so then you've got the drive lane and, and the bike facility next to each other with this three feet of space. Um, the, the major concern I heard was um, when when we have the bike facility right next to the drive lane, it makes it uh, it increases the likelihood of of a vehicle um, entering the the bike facility and making it more dangerous to use that bike facility. Um, can you help me understand um, the change that I? I, I believe I see reflected here. I know you've talked about with me, um, but can you, can you just talk about what has been done here to prevent vehicles from entering that bike facility? Sure, Madam Chair, uh, uh, Council Member Chugtai. Uh, the revised design is very, very similar to the original design in terms of having that curb along the east side of the roadway. The only difference is about an inch. So it's still a very vertical curb. It's a curb separated protected bikeway. It follows our street design guide. That one inch is just enough for our fire trucks to be able to come up only if needed um, and be able to, to move across along the street um, if there's an obstruction or they need to set up their rig. Um, we do know that there are challenges with unauthorized and unpermitted parking in bikeways and that happens no matter what bikeway design we have. It happens when we're on street. It happens when we're nowhere near a street on a trail. It happens. Um, the absence of any signage here um, does not permit that activity. It's, it's still unauthorized activity. So engineering is a tool that we can use to help mitigate these types of activities, but ultimately we can't eliminate it. Um, and that's where we have to address it with, in other ways, the other E's we call it. Um, so there's enforcement, there's education, there's encouragement. Um, so that's an, an element of this design that we're committed to continue to evaluate and understand and look for options to mitigate that activity. Unauthorized, mm -hmm. unpermitted, 
for sure. Um, and then just the aha moment for me, I think on, on this was you helping me see that the bikes were higher than the drive lane, right? Like it, they're up on a curb. And so we're not talking about just three feet of space in between the drive lane and the bike facility. We are talking about a physical separation that has been, um, that has been put in place as a, as a preventative measure. Um, but to your point, obviously we're not, we're never going to prevent all unauthorized, um, or, or it is really difficult to prevent all unauthorized, um, uh, uses of the bike facility. But I see that there is, there is, there is an effort to mitigate that to the extent practical here. Um, and then, uh, I'm wondering, so I, I think you, you shared a lot of really good examples and photos, um, demonstrating the, the challenges with, parking and driveways, um, with emergency vehicles being able to navigate our street. I know that the, the Walker facility on, on 36th and Bryant, um, is, is a emergency, um, uh, EMS is there every day, fire is there every day. And so it's really, really important for Bryant to be accessible for our emergency vehicles, um, so that residents can receive care um, in the time that they need it. So, and then uh, also the challenges you pointed out with cars and delivery trucks, um, idling or driving in the bike facility, which at that time was right next to sidewalks. And so we're talking about a really, really dangerous thing happening there for pedestrians, for um, cyclists, for residents, and and frankly, drivers too. Um, did you did you have any um, like 311, 911 data to, to help us um, to help us understand the scale and scope of the scale of the problem? Madam Chair, Councilmember Chug Tai, uh, we did dig into calls to 311. We don't have exact data, and the reason is because we have an active project. At least I understand the reason. Jen left. Um, <laughs> I understand the reason is we have an active project. Um, so when those calls come in with an active project contact, they're going to that project contact and may not have a case recorded in the system for further follow-up. So, so yes, we got a lot of, just like council member, our vice, uh, president Palmasano noted, we got a lot of feedback, a lot of feedback and also from our, our staff within the city enterprise as well. Awesome. That's very helpful. Thank you so much. Um, and then the, the, the last piece or actually one more, um, the the 38th through 36th st uh, stretch that isn't um, that doesn't change at all from the originally approved layout, um, and I just I really apologize I was not here when the layout was approved. I've read the originally approved layout; it's the most detailed layout I've ever seen. Um, but uh, can you just quick speak to the impact on um, like? the Walker facility and whether the, the, the um, reverse bus flow is to allow for buses to come directly in front of the facility. Um, are there any concerns with emergency vehicle access on, on that stretch? So Madam Chair, Councilmember Chug Tai, um, these two blocks not changing um, is, is an important detail. One of the reasons we don't need to change these blocks is because of that reverse flow bus lane gives us extra width within the street. Um, we did a lot of work with the walker during our original community engagement phase. I can't stand here and tell you that they love this design, um, but we did a lot of work with them to try to address their concerns and ensure that there would be adequate access to their facility at all times. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then uh, the, the, so I, I appreciate you walking us through um, the bump outs versus chicanes in, it, where they're being replaced and the efficacy of those in, in slowing down traffic um, and being a, a traffic calming element on this, in this re, redesign. Um, I know there are chicanes on, on Grand Avenue as an example. And one of the concerns I heard from you um, or from staff, not you personally, um, was the the challenge with snow plows, being able to remove snow um, with with those chicanes because it's not a straight line, and it, it then it was um, narrowing the street more than what we had already planned for. Um, I know that that same type of problem. Um, doesn't exist on Grand Avenue, or or at least it's not as significant as we've seen it um, 
present itself on, on Bryant Avenue. Um, can you help us understand why that might be the case on, on Grand Avenue, but it, Bryant Avenue that it isn't? Sure, Madam Chair, Councilmember Chuck Tai, I'm gonna pull up a slide we did not have as part of the original presentation to help answer your question. Amazing. Um, so the main difference between Bryant and Grand Avenue is the width of the street. So Grand Avenue is a two-way street, generally with parking on one side of the street. We have 28 feet curb to curb to work with on Grand Avenue. Bryant Avenue um, is more like 20 feet um, where we have parking on one side of the street. Um, so that's the main difference there uh, is, is just the space that we have available to us. This is what it looks like in plan view. And um, I did go out with Chief Tyner's staff back in January. We looked at Grand, we looked at Bryant, we looked at Johnson Street Northeast, we went all over. Um, and you can just see it feels very different. One of the key things for our plow drivers too is some sort of vertical indication for them and the edge of these features so they know where the curb line is and can, they're in big vehicles, they need the help, they just, you know, they're doing the best they can. So for sure. I really appreciate this. Thank you very much. And then I think my last question, um, I, I understand. So you, I know you've got a really big day of community engagement today. You're here, you're going to be at the, um, pedestrian advisory committees subcommittee today. Um, and you're hosting a community meeting to talk about, um, changes to, to the design elements this evening from six 30 to eight 30 virtually. Um, I, I see you, doing your best to communicate changes, to sit with people and struggle with the things that, that are sore points. Um, and I see that as an honest effort to, um, to, to correct the mistakes that are, that we can't go back and change now. Um, I really, one, appreciate you doing that. Thank you. Thank you for taking it seriously. And then two, um, I, a question that I've been asked a lot is just, or, or sometimes it's in the form of a question, sometimes it's just in the form of like a long comment, but um, just this this frustration and this lack of trust that, you know, I'm a person who lives over here, or I'm a person who uses the street a lot. I, I invested so much time in, um, in the years of community engagement that was completed. I was thoughtful in the comments that I shared. Um, I struggled with my neighbors on this. I, I did my part. And, um, and I saw that that was, that was reflected in the plan that was approved by council. And so it seems like all of that was for nothing when last minute changes can get made. And, and that um, I think contributes to, to this like mistrust between the city and, and residents. And um, I know that's something you're aware of. I, I guess my question is like, what do, you, what, what do you, what do we say to residents who are, who are expressing that type of frustration? Uh, Madam Chair, Councilmember Chugtai, I think the first thing we say is we're sorry. We're sorry. We missed some things in design, and we missed an opportunity to do a better job of communicating the changes. So we are coming out, and we're doing our very best to share the information, and we're doing our very best to honor that original community engagement and input that we received and stay within the boundaries of our council-adopted concept layout. I really appreciate that. Um, and then I'll just I'll just end with I I re thank you so much for being here again. I really appreciate the 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 time and attention you put to coming and being communicative and transparent with the public to the extent that was that was possible. Um, and for for answering questions about this, um, I wish you the very best of luck with all of the community engagement you're doing later today. And and I see deeply and honestly that you have done the very best you can with the cards you were dealt and the very best you can to preserve as much of uh of of the engagement and input that you receive from community um and i i just deeply appreciate that thank you thank you very much all right thank you so much um uh, without objection i will direct the clerk to file this report uh, and with that we've concluded all business to come before the committee and without objection I we stand adjourned thank you everyone
There has been recent research that's showing that bee populations are declining. So we're doing this because there is habitat loss going on, there is different pesticides that are harming our bee populations, and then there are also diseases and parasites. So you have to like rip them away. 